and welcome to Ministry to Muslims. I'm your host tonight, Carmen. And tonight we have a special show for you. We have, um, we'd like to promote a few things going on. Our first promotion would be Al Fadi. Um, he has a conference coming up called, it is called um, Let the Nations Be Glad. So we're going to have Abd Al Fadi come on and talk about that. He's not going to be showing his face today. He's just got um, audio. But um, hi, how are you? Yeah, hi, Carm. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry I am driving and uh, just the timing, unfortunately, didn't work out for me. But uh, thank you again for this invitation and for your willingness to promote the conference. Yes, no problem. Um, just be safe. Make sure you stop at all the red lights. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your conference. I know that the last couple of years I've been a part of it and I've seen I've seen all the amazing speakers that you've had. And this year you have an incredible lineup. You have Dr. J, you have Laura Powell, Dr. David Wood. You have tonight we have Dr. Tony Costa and he's also going to be speaking at your conference. And we have many, many more. Um, tell us about it. That's true. And Carm, you are going to be called upon to help. So don't worry. Just uh, <laughs> I'm always available just, for you. No wait, problem. Wait, wait upon the call. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, the conference is online and we praise God for the opportunity to have a, an online platform, of course, to do so. It really started it back in the days of COVID. Uh, so this year is no exception. Uh, it's still the same, like you stated. Uh, the only difference is that instead of having uh, four uh, basically uh, separate tracks. We combined all the tracks in two days uh, to make it easy. Instead of two weekends in a row, Saturday, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Friday, Saturday, we made it just only one weekend. And that means that we have to really cut back on certain length of plenary sessions and so on and so forth. We are going to be doing this on October 11th. That's uh, Friday. And then October 12th, that's Saturday. On October uh, 11th, which is Friday, we have the first track uh, is going to be on reaching refugees, specifically, of course, Muslim refugees. And uh, we have brothers like George Husni, for instance, will be speaking up, uh, to that extent from his experience, of course. And uh, we need to pray for him and those who are in Lebanon because they are uh, seeing firsthand now people being displaced. And the second half of that uh, day will cover the second track, which is another equally important one, ministry to women, and in particular, of course, Muslim women. And we have practitioners who are in that field. And of course, we are so excited to have uh, uh, Sister uh, Laura Powell, hopefully soon will be Dr. Powell, uh, who is speaking about that uh, also uh, in terms of her practical experience and so on and so forth. The second day, which is uh, Saturday, we have at least the first part of the day, we'll be covering just evangelism in general, how to reach Muslim uh, students, how to reach Muslim immigrants, and uh, the effective ways, of course, to reach out to them and things to uh, avoid uh, when you are doing this type of evangelism, or at least practices that are not biblical, put it this way. And then the second half, of course, of that day, we'll have our very popular track, which is polemic and apologetics. And that's where we have people like Dr. Tony Costa, uh, whom, whom we are very honored, of course, uh, to have him. Dr., uh, like I said, Jay Smith, Dr. David Wood. Some of these, by the way, Anthony Rogers is also going to be there. And I believe Dr. Edward Delcor have agreed to uh, come in. Some of these uh, lessons might be recorded just because it's congested. And uh, it will be at least shown as recorded to the people. Others will be live. And... Uh, Depending on each day, we may have a panel discussion that allows people uh, to ask questions through the chat, uh, basically, options. I, I think that this is such a wonderful conference that you're hosting. As you saw with our Strong Tower conference, how many people showed up and how were, they were invested in every single um, topic that we had to share. And it really is useful, especially with people coming into our country um, in all different parts of the state. And we need to know how to speak to them and talk to them. Um, I think this is amazing and I'm so happy that you're doing this. How can people in the chat um, how can we, how can they be a part of it? How can they, what, what do they have to do? Yes, uh, and I think the flyer have also the link at the bottom, but I'll, I'll say that. 
Uh, the flyer basically, uh, I'm sorry, the, the link uh, for registration, I should say, is Alfadi Academy, one word, Alfadi Academy.com forward slash conference. Again, okay. it's Al, yeah, Alfadi Academy.com forward slash conference. And people can still take advantage of our discount, even though our rates are very low because we do not make it about money just to pay for the uh, platform and take care of our wonderful speakers. Yes. Um, Nate did put that in the chat. So if you guys, if you guys, you guys do see it, just click on that, get your tickets. You don't want to miss it. Um, and will they be able to download um, all of this or how will that work? Will they be able to go back and look at it later? Yes. Our strategy always to uh, maintain privacy of this conference. We don't want it to be public, but yeah. to, uh, people who register, whether they attended or didn't, they always get a link to re the recordings of the sessions that uh, took place. That's good because, you know, sometimes we like to go back and take notes and um, it's very helpful. Um, of course. Anything else that you'd like to add? No, I'm uh, just thankful for uh, for you guys and thank you, thankful for, uh, you know, the ministry that you had uh, recently in California. I had the privilege, really, of joining you and others as well. So praise the Lord for that. And just one thing that might come as a surprise to everybody, but I was diagnosed with something unusual in my heart. Uh, the, the, the cardiologist is kind of concerned about it. So prayer for the next step that uh, it will, they will rule out anything that is uh, troubling. Hopefully it is just a normal thing that could be taken care of. But prayer for that because we need to do something right away. I'm sorry to hear that. And we will be praying. We have a good team over here, always in the chat. Everybody's always lifting one another up. So we'll, we'll be keeping you in prayer. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And and Tony, Dr. Tony Costa, welcome. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Carm. It's great to be on. And I'm glad to hear my dear brother, El Fadi. And uh, brother, you could be assured that we will be covering your prayers as well. Thank you so much, brother. Welcome. Okay, so we'll be keeping, we'll, throughout the show, we will um, we'll be showing the link so you guys can um, click on it and get your tickets. Um, you guys don't want to miss it. It is an incredible type of conference. Um, we really encourage you guys to be a part of such, you know, conferences like this because to every single one of these speakers has an amazing gift and they share it with us and they do it with such grace and 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 their love and just like all of us here their love for muslims that's what drives us to do what we do is that you know we have nothing but love for them for the lost all of the lost but especially for muslims and so this is what we do and you know just um i would love for you guys to all be a part of this so share it with your friends especially if you live in a city that has you know a lot of muslims there um you know share it with your friends um you never know what the Lord will do. So thank you, Al-Fadi, for joining us tonight and drive safe, and we'll be praying for you. Thank you so much. Blessings to all of you. Blessings. So before we begin, I'm going to introduce Dr. Tony Costa. Tony's chief passion is in teaching and engaging students of any background in lively class discussion and interaction. He encourages them to ask thought-provoking questions and believes that Lifelong learning should be fun and life-changing. He is a professor with Toronto Baptist Seminary, uh, Providence, Providence Theological Seminary in Franklin, Tennessee. He is the author of Worship and the Risen Jesus in the Pauline Letters, as well as a contributor of scholarly essays in Christian origins and Greco-Roman culture and Christian origins and Hellenistic Judaism and various journals. And also, uh, an early Christian's creeds and hymns, and he's coming out with a new book, has not been released, but it's called No King But Christ. So look forward, look out for that when he posts that. If you don't follow Tony, Dr. Tony Costa, he's on Facebook, he's on YouTube, and um, you will get your information there. So welcome, Tony. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back, Carm. It's good to have you. So your topic over there uh, for Al with uh, Abd Al Fadi is hypostatic union, right? Yes, we're going to be talking about the uh, the relationship between the natures in Christ, the divine and the human. And uh, a lot of Christians uh, are not overly familiar with this, but it's a very important idea: the incarnation and how Christ is both God and man. And what does that mean for for Christ to be one person with two natures? And so when Christians become familiar with that very important distinction, 
then it it helps them communicate with Muslims because Muslims don't understand how God can be man and how could man be God and they 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 see that as a contradiction but it's because they don't understand um, the the biblical doctrine of the incarnation and so I'm hoping that this will help facilitate uh, communication with their Muslim friends so that next time Muslims challenge them they they can say well actually this is what we believe we don't believe what the quran says about jesus this is actually what we believe and so i think it will help further the the the, the gospel witness with our muslim friends i absolutely agree with you i think a lot of churches neglect this part of teaching in their churches a lot of um people in the church can't explain the hypostatic union and i think that in order to uh, effective you know the um evangelize, we need to know first what the Bible teaches and what it means, because you're right, this is the number one question that Muslims, they don't understand it. And if mm -hmm. we can't explain it to them, then it's just like a, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's a useless conversation, but we don't really get anywhere because we're not, we're not, we don't understand it and they're not understanding it. So um, I really highly encourage anyone in the chat, especially like this topic is a really good one. It's for all Christians. Um, it really will help us in all that we do. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to do that um, specifically. That's It's a good topic. Um, and tonight you're going to be showing us how Muhammad's prophesied in the Bible, right? He's there? Yeah. He's there? Yeah, It's a yes and no answer. <laughs> okay. Well, I can't wait to, to hear about that. So I'll let you all get right. into that and then um, I'll see you at the end. Okay. I just need my PowerPoint if it yeah. can be brought up. Yep, that I'll bring that up for you. Great, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, how much time do I have? I just want to be uh, respective of the time. You have as long as it takes, but we usually like maybe an hour, something okay. like that. Okay, very I'll good. Order. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Carm. You're welcome. Well, hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And those of you who are in California, I, I want to apologize. I unfortunately was not able to make it. I, I regret uh, that I couldn't be with you. Uh, in 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 California, I've always wanted to be in the state of California. Never been there, uh, but to, due to some health uh, issues, I was detained, unfortunately, from heading down. So, God willing, next time. And I and I would also appreciate your prayers. As you know, those of us who are committed to this type of ministry are usually under a lot of satanic attack. A lot of satanic obstacles are put in our way, and so I would covet the prayers of God's people that you would uh, also not just myself, but cover those of us who are also involved in Islamic apologetics. So tonight, I want to talk to you about, is Muhammad mentioned in the Bible? This is a common claim that we hear from our Muslim friends. So why do Muslims make this claim? Well, this argument is advanced by Muslims for the purpose of enhancing the person of Muhammad. And what we need to understand is that Muslims will say to us, well, don't you know that our prophet is mentioned in your Bible? And if our prophet is mentioned in your Bible, well, then you should become a Muslim. So Muslims make this claim, number one, to enhance the person of Muhammad. And secondly, they make this argument to convince the Jews and the Christians, who are called the people of the book, the Al-Kitab in, in Arabic, they use this to convert them to Islam since Muhammad is the promised prophet predicted in their scriptures. Now, to place Muhammad in the scriptural tradition, they also do this so that they can align him with the biblical prophets. In other words, what they're trying to say is that since Muhammad is a prophet and the, and the Bible mentions Muhammad, well, then you as Christians should become Muslims as well since he is predicted in your Bible. Now, what is ironic about this is that the reason why Muslims have to make this claim, this is important, the reason why they must make this claim is because the Quran compels them to make this claim. The Quran says in Surah 7, verse 157, those who followed the apostle, that's Muhammad, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the law and the gospel. So because the Quran says that Muhammad is mentioned in their own scriptures, the Muslims have to find supposed references to Muhammad in the Bible. But notice what it says here. He's mentioned in the law, the Torah, and the Injil, that is the gospel. 
But some Muslims will say, oh, Muhammad's mentioned in the book of Isaiah. But then they say, well, the only books we recognize is the Torah of Moses, the Gospel of Jesus, and the Zabur, the Psalms of David. But that doesn't stop the Muslims from looking and scouring through all of the Bible to try to prove Muhammad is in there. So they need us. We don't need them. We don't need the Quran. They need the Bible because of this passage that says Muhammad is found mentioned. So notice it says he is mentioned in their own scriptures, which means that some Muslims believe that the name Muhammad was in the Bible, but then some Jews and Christians deleted it. They removed it from the Bible. And that, of course, is utter nonsense. The evidence shows otherwise. So once again, Muslims need the Bible. We don't need the Quran. So what I call this, as I call it, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So if the Quran claims that Muhammad is mentioned in the Bible, the Old and New Testament, then does that not imply that the Bible is reliable? I mean, why would God mention Muhammad in a corrupted book? But Muslims claim the Bible has been corrupted by both Jews and Christians. Well, if Muslims are going to be, uh, if Muslims are in fact, by arguing this way, they're being inconsistent when they quote the Bible to prove Muhammad is predicted therein and then argue it is corrupted and untrustworthy. You can't have it both ways. Either the Bible is reliable and Muhammad's in there, or the Bible is unreliable and Muhammad's not in there. So as my good friend, Dr. James White, is, is fond of saying, an inconsistent argument is the sign of a failed argument. So if an argument is inconsistent, folks, and this applies to Islam, it applies to, if you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, if you're dealing with atheists, it doesn't matter. If your argument is inconsistent, then your argument fails. It cannot be true if it is inconsistent. And so Muslims want to praise the Bible on one side of their mouth and then condemn the Bible on the other side of their mouth. So basically, where the Bible agrees with the Quran, the Bible is right. Where the Bible disagrees with the Quran, the Bible is wrong. Just like the Mormons, where the Bible contradicts the Book of Mormon, the Bible's wrong. Where the Bible agrees with the Book of Mormon, the Bible is right. So it's, I, it's, it's, we're back to this, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Now, there's also selective reading of the Bible. Muslims operate the same way as the cults do. They selectively pick and choose what parts of the Bible agree with the Quran and which will serve their agenda and cause. They reject parts of the Bible that contradict Islamic teachings found in the Quran. The Islamic standard that judges the Bible is the Quran itself. And so I'm sorry if you can't read the bottom line there, but what it says there is the Bible is already presumed guilty by the Quran before it's even put on trial. So right from the get-go, Muslims will say, oh, the Quran is, the Bible is corrupted, the Bible is corrupted. But then if the Bible is corrupted, well, then Muhammad cannot possibly be in the Bible because how can we trust a corrupted book? So Muslims always play both sides of the field here. And that's the problem. And they don't see it. This is what surprises me with my debates with Muslims or dialogues with Muslims. They don't see the double standards that they engage in. So they'll, they'll, they'll use one set of standards uh, uh, against the Bible that they would not use on the Quran. And so uh, that shows inconsistency. So I'm going to focus on three main biblical passages that Muslims use to say that Muhammad is predicted in, in the Bible. So the first two are taken from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 19. The second one is the Song of Solomon, 516. The last one comes from the New Testament, John 14, 16 to 17 and verse 26 and John 15, 26 and uh, John 16 and verse 7. So let's look at the first one, Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 19. So here God is saying through Moses, I will raise up for them, the Israelites, a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. So here in Deuteronomy, you have a prophecy that God is going to raise up for the Israelites, a prophet like Moses. Notice it says he will come from among their brothers. This prophet will rise among their brothers, that is the Israelites, the tribes of Israel. God says, I'm going to put my words in his mouth and he's going to tell them everything I command him. So this prophet that is going to come is going to be like Moses. God's going to put his words in his mouth and he's going to speak God's words 
to his people. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. So what we see here is that this particular prophet who is to come, if people reject his message, God himself will call him to account. So there are serious ramifications in rejecting the message of the prophet who is coming, who is like Moses. Now, what is a prophet like Moses like? So if a prophet is like Moses, then they must meet the following criteria. What do they have to be? Well, Deuteronomy 34, 10 to 11 tells us what kind of, kind of a prophet Moses was. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. So Deuteronomy tells us that Moses was the type of prophet that God knew face to face. He had an intimate, personal relationship with God, so personal that it's called face-to-face. -face. He was also a prophet who did miraculous signs and wonders that God sent him to do, and that those signs were seen and, and witnessed by Pharaoh and all those in Egypt. Now, even the Quran admits that Moses performed miraculous signs. So in the Quran, Surah 7, 103 to 118, it tells us there that Moses performed miracles and signs before Pharaoh. So whoever this prophet is, folks, that is coming, like Moses, he must meet the criteria of being a prophet who knows God face to face, who does miraculous signs and does wonders. Now, the Quran itself admits that Muhammad did not perform any miracles. Muhammad cannot be that prophet. Muslims say that Muhammad is the prophet like Moses, but Muhammad cannot be that prophet because Muhammad, number one, didn't perform miracles. So the Quran says in Surah 13, verse 7, the unbelievers say, why has a sign not been sent down upon him, that's Muhammad, from his Lord? And then Allah says, thou, Muhammad, are only a warner and a guide to every people. So Allah says Muhammad's purpose is to be two things, to warn the people of Allah's judgments, and number two, to be a guide to every people. Notice that Allah doesn't say, and you're going to perform miracles. Nowhere does the Quran ever, ever, ever say that Muhammad performed miracles. You have reports of miracles later in the Hadith, but the Hadith are over 200 years after Muhammad's death, and they're highly suspect because they contradict the Quran. Muhammad did not perform any signs or wonders. So why is it that Muhammad cannot be the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 19? Well, number one, God spoke directly or face to face with Moses. Allah did not speak face to face with Muhammad, but through the angel Gabriel. So in the Quran, it is through the angel Gabriel that Allah conveys his revelations. He did not speak face to face with Muhammad in the Quran. You may have that in the Hadith, but again, the Quran is very clear that Muhammad received revelation through the angel Gabriel. The only proper candidate who meets that prophecy of, of Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 19 is a prophet who would be like Moses, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Well, how do we know that? Well, he performed miraculous signs and wonders during his ministry. Even the Quran admits that Jesus performed miracles and signs. And we also know that Jesus spoke face to face with, with God. And in fact, Jesus had an eternal direct relationship with God the Father from all eternity because as the word, he was face to face with God. So John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And that phrase, and the word was with God, the, the Greek is proston theon, it the word pros, P-R-O-S, the, pre the preposition pros, which means towards, it also carries the meaning of face-to-face -face relationship. So if a person is pros, that is towards another person, they are face-to-face -face with them. And so Jesus Christ, as the eternal word, the eternal son, eternally was face-to-face -face with God in eternal relationship with God the Father. And so we read as well that uh, in his own prayer that, Jesus said, glorify them with the glory I had with you before the world was created. 
Now, how do we know that Jesus is that prophet predicted by Moses? Well, Jesus himself told us. So in John 5, verse 46, what does he say? If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So where did Moses write about Jesus? In Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 19. So Jesus himself admits, Moses wrote about me. And if you believed Moses, then you would believe me because I'm the prophet that he was speaking about. There's no doubt about this, fa this fact, folks. Jesus identifies himself as that prophet. And then in John 1, 45, Jesus' first disciples, when they believed in him, they said that he is the one, quote, whom Moses wrote about in the law. Well, who is this one? Well, it's the Messiah, Jesus. Moses wrote about him in the law, in the Torah, which is composed of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So even the disciples understood that Moses predicted the coming of the Messiah as that prophet who is like Moses. And in John 7, verse 40, <clears throat> we know that even the people of his day testified and said, surely this man is the prophet. Who is the prophet? The prophet like Moses. Even Peter, the apostle Peter, and even Stephen, the deacon who was martyred, appealed specifically to Deuteronomy 18.18 18 as a prophecy which was fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah. And that you can find in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 19 to 26, and book of Acts 7, verse 37, and verse 52. So another argument Muslims use is that the expression, their brothers, in Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, refers to the Ishmaelites who were half-brothers of the Israelites by virtue of the fact that they were both descended from Abraham. They actually believe this. Muslims argue that Arabs were descendants of Ishmael, and therefore, and therefore Muhammad was a descendant of Ishmael, and by doing that, they can connect him to Abraham. But here's the problem, folks. The Arabs are not descendants of Ishmael. There's a lot of research has gone into this. Even the Hadith admits this. Because in the Hadith, when Ishmael was taken by his mother, Hagar, when Abraham basically threw them out, Hagar and Ishmael, according to the Hadith, not according to biblical history, according to the Hadith, it says they went to the valley of Mecca. And while they were there, it says that Ishmael was raised and taught archery by Arabs in the region. Well, if Ishmael is a young lad at this time, he's just a young boy, and he's being taught archery from the Arabs, well, he can't be the father of the Arabs because there's already Arabs in the region. They're descended from another um, patriarch, not Ishmael. Even the Quran never ever mentions Muhammad as a descendant of Ishmael. This develops much, much later in Islamic history to try to connect Muhammad to Abraham. And so they use this argument to say that Muhammad was a descendant of Abraham, and therefore, if he's an Arab, and a descendant of Ishmael, then that means he would be a brother of the Jews. Nice try, but no cigar. It doesn't follow. There is no connection between Ishmael and the Arabs. Now, the term brothers used uh, in Deuteronomy, is, is very important, folks, is used to talk about fellow Israelites. It's not talking about Ishmael or, or Esau or Edom and so forth. Notice in, in Deuteronomy 18, 1 to 2, it says, the priests who are Levites, indeed the whole tribe of Levi, are to have no allotment or inheritance with Israel. They, the Levites, shall have no inheritance among their brothers. Well, who are the brothers here? Well, the brothers here are fellow Israelites. The Levites are not to have any land allotment. Why? Because the inheritance of the Levites is the Lord. They are to serve the Lord in the tabernacle and then later the temple. They had no inheritance because they were to serve in the temple, the tabernacle. They were to minister, to officiate. And that's why the Levites were not given, given any land inheritance. Notice Deuteronomy 17.15, when God predicts the rise of the monarchy in Israel, that is the rise of the king, be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers, do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. So notice the king that they will have must be from among their brothers. He cannot be a foreigner. He can't be an Ishmaelite. He cannot be from another 
nation. So that language of brothers refers to fellow Israelites. And so uh, again, sorry, you, I can't. We can't see the bottom line, but Jesus came from the nation of Israel. He came from the tribe of Judah, and therefore he is one of their brothers. He fits the bill, and not Muhammad. Now the second uh, passage they go to, and this I find very. This is one of my one of the most uh, hilarious parts of uh, of Islam, um, is the fact that they go to this book called the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs. Some Muslims actually claim that this book is pornographic because it is because it has such rich sexual imagery, because it's talking about the marriage of Solomon to his wife. This is a marital song. It's poetic. It's one of the five uh, wisdom books in the Bible. So remember in the Old Testament, folks, there's five books that are poetic, and they're, uh, they're called the wisdom literature. Why five? Well, we've got the five books of the Torah, uh, we have five books that comprise the Psalms. Remember, the number five points back to the law, to the Torah, the law of God. And so the five books of wisdom are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And they're called wisdom literature because they are poetic. They're Hebrew poetry. And so Muslims go to this passage and they say, look, Muhammad is found here. It says, his mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover, this my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Well, we're looking at this passage and we're saying, well, wait a minute, where, where's Muhammad here? Uh, sh this is the bride here speaking of her husband. His mouth is sweetness. And, and she says he's altogether lovely. Uh, and she says, this is my lover, this is my friend. But notice that this song is situated where? It's not situated in Mecca. It's situated in Jerusalem, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is where the royal wedding is taking place in Jerusalem, the royal city. And so the, the context itself is telling us that we're talking about Jerusalem. We're not talking about Mecca. We're not talking about Medina. Okay, so how do Muslims get Muhammad in here? Well, Muslims point out that the phrase altogether lovely in Hebrew is the word mahmadim. Mahmadim. So the word Mahmadim is the Hebrew word used there in Song of Solomon 516. But here's the problem. The Hebrew word Mahmadim is a third person masculine pronoun and it comes from the word the root word Mahmad. And what they do is they actually argue that the Hebrew word Mahmad is actually Muhammad, which is absolutely hilarious. And this is an example of what I call the phonetic fallacy. Uh, I, I think I've come up with this term because I've seen people on YouTube and online saying things like, where did this word, this term, <laughs> this term, the phonetic fallacy, come from? They don't know where they heard it or or, or who started it. I, I, I think I'm one of the, I think I'm the first to use the word phonetic fallacy. And, and let me tell you what a phonetic fallacy is. Because the word sounds like Muhammad, they're saying, well, it's Muhammad. Because it sounds like Muhammad. But but there's a major, major problem here. And this is like the word concept fallacy. And, and, and when Muslims say to me that Mahmad Mahmadim is Muhammad, I play the same trick on them. And I will simply say, well, I can prove to you from the Bible that Muhammad is a mouse. And they will say, well, what do you mean? How could you, how, what do you mean Allah is a mouse? Well, you say Allahu Akbar, right? And Allah, uh, Allahu Akbar means Allah is greater, not great or greatest, but greater. They said, yes, we say Allahu Akbar means Allah is greater. But then in Leviticus 11, in the dietary laws, one of the animals that God tells Israel not to eat is the Akbar. What is the Akbar? The Akbar in Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word Akbar means mouse. Akbar is mouse. And so... When I hear you Muslims say Allahu Akbar, you're saying Allahu, uh, Allah is a mouse. Allah is mighty mouse. And they get all offended at that. And I said, I'm just doing what you're doing. You look at the Song of Solomon and you say, Mahmadim, Mahmad, that means Muhammad, when it doesn't. Well, if you make Solomon Muhammad, then I can make Allah mouse. I can make him mighty mouse. And it's right there. If you, if you, if you know Hebrew, all you have to do is look at Leviticus 11, just do a search on the word mouse, 
And surprise, surprise, the word mouse in Hebrew is Akbar. And so Allahu Akbar, that sounds like Allah is a mouse. And they'll say, oh, no, but that is, we're talking Arabic. Right. And this is Hebrew. This is not Arabic. So the first problem with this line of reasoning is that the word Mahmad, it's not a proper name. It's not like John, Tom, or even Muhammad. It functions as an adjective. And what is an adjective? An adjective describes a noun. Even though it's a noun, it's functioning like an adjective. The Song of Solomon is a love poem addressed the, addressing the delights of marital love between a husband and his wife. The word Mahmad means desirable. It means precious thing, pleasant thing. And its plural form is Mahmadim in the Song of Solomon. And when a word is used in the plural in Hebrew, it's intended to heighten the sense of that word. And so when Muslims claim that the Song of Solomon is a pornographic book, the next question we need to ask is, what is Muhammad doing appearing in a pornographic book? What does that mean? You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't speak from both sides of your mouth. And so the Song of Solomon has absolutely nothing to do with Muhammad. Mahmadim, Mahmad does not mean Muhammad. It means desirable, pleasant, a precious thing. And it's used throughout the Old Testament. And if you put the word Muhammad in those other places, it will make no sense. It'd be pure gibberish. The other problem is that in the Song of Solomon 5.1, it says, uh, this passage, Song of Solomon, has to do with the description of the lover in the poem as being altogether lovely or very desirable to his wife. Here's another problem. The other major problem for the Muslim is that the context of the passage is that in Song of Solomon 5.1, the husband or lover speaks the following words, I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey, I have drunk my wine. So this one, who is the same as Mahmad, the pleasant one, the one who's altogether pleasant, he drinks wine. Does Muhammad drink wine? Do, do Muslims drink wine? No, they don't. So how could this one, who is the one called Mahmad, the altogether lovely, he drinks wine. But Muhammad doesn't drink wine. So this cannot be Muhammad. This is a reference to Solomon. The Quran says in Surah 5, verse 90, all you who believe strong drink and games of chance and idols and divine arrows are only an infamy of Satan's handiwork. Leave it aside that you may succeed. So the Quran condemns the drinking of strong drink and alcohol. So the Song of Solomon has absolutely nothing to do with Muhammad. It has as much to do with Muhammad as a Jewish fortune cookie. Nothing in common at all. Now, in the New Testament, what Muslims do is they go to the Gospel of John, which is ironic because the Gospel of John is the gospel that is the most attacked by Muslims because it has such a high view of, of, of Jesus Christ. But the Gospel of John is the go-to that they, that they want to show that Muhammad is mentioned there. So the Gospel of John forcefully advocates the deity of Christ and amplifies the identity of Jesus as the Son of God. And yet John is the, is the main text that receives the most scathing attack from Muslims. Where Muslims feel the Gospel of John can be used to support the Quran, it is right. Where it does not, it is wrong. So what is this again, folks? You can't have your cake and eat it too, syndrome. So it always surprises me when Muslims come to me and say, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, the Father is greater than I. That means Jesus isn't God. So I return, I ask them this question. Did Jesus call God Father? Did he say the Father is greater than, did he refer to God as Father? The Muslims go quiet. So what happened? Did the cat, the cat cut your tongue? What happened? Did Jesus call God Father? Uh, no, oh, well, no, no, no. Uh, God is not the Father of anyone. So did Jesus actually say those words, the Father is greater than I? If Jesus said those words, then you should become a Christian because Jesus calls God Father. But if Jesus didn't say those words, then why are you quoting them? So you see, there's the inconsistency again, always the inconsistency. So in John 14, 16 to 17 and 26 and 15 to 26, you will notice here that Jesus identifies the comforter or the counselor or the helper with who? 
the Holy Spirit. I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. So clearly Jesus is telling us that the Father is going to give you another counselor, another comforter. Well, why is he another comforter? Because Jesus has been their comforter, their counselor to this point. But when Jesus leaves, the Father is not going to leave them as orphans. He's going to send them another helper, another comforter, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said in uh, John 14, 26, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, he even identifies who he is, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So notice, if you notice very closely here, folks, what do you see? You are, you are seeing right in front of your eyes the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the economical Trinity, the triune God working in concert, in unison, to bring about his purposes. So the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, that is through the Son, he's going to teach you everything. So you see how Trinitarian these passages are? Look at John 15, 26. When the counselor comes, the Holy Spirit, now notice this, whom I will send to you from the Father. Who sends the Holy Spirit? Now, Jesus sends him from the Father. But who is the only one who can send the Holy Spirit? Only God can send the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you from the Father. He goes out from the Father, and he will testify about me. Trinitarian language. Notice Jesus calls God Father here. Muslims won't allow this. Jesus says, but I tell you the truth. It's good. It's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So very Trinitarian passages, and also the fact that the Lord Jesus here is clearly speaking of himself in the context of the Trinity and refers to God as Father. So Muslims claim that the counselor or the comforter in these passages in John's gospel is really, in fact, Muhammad. Wow. He's in the first, they're, they're not the first to say this, by the way. Heretics in the past uh, like the Montanists and, and even the Baha'i faith, they claim that their founders were are the, are the counselor or the comforter. The Greek word for counselor or comforter or uh, helper, folks, is the word parakletos. Parakletos. I mean, you could you could repeat that. You could you could repeat after me. Parakletos. The parakletos. The word parakletos literally means to one who is called alongside of. Right. See the word para there. It's like it's the word we use for something like, like a parachute or a parachurch. A parachurch ministry is something that comes alongside of the church, right? And the word kleto means to call. So a parakletos means one who is called to the side. And that's why it's sometimes translated as an advocate, a, an attorney, because an, an advocate is one who comes alongside of his client to defend him. But Muslims claim that the original Greek word here, this is, this is I mean, when you teach Greek New Testament, when you teach Greek in, in university, seminary levels, and Muslims are trying to pretend they know Greek, especially the Greek New Testament, and they have the audacity to say that the word here is actually not parakletos, but paraklutos, that's a different Greek word, which means the praised one. Why do they want to say that the word is actually paraklutos? Because paraklutos in Greek is the equivalent of the Arabic name Ahmad, which means the praised one. And Ahmed, Muslims claim, is the shorter form of the name of Muhammad. But here's the problem, folks. Here's the problem. We have over 24,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. Over 5,800 of them are in Greek. And in the oldest copy of the Gospel of John that we have, that dates to about 200 AD, and other copies, never once does that word paraklutos, the second word, never once does it appear in any, any Greek manuscript. Every single one of them says paracletos, the comforter, the helper, the counselor. So what is this? This is a pipe dream. They're making it up on the fly. 
That's how desperate they are. When you have to be this desperate, I mean, the jig is up. So why do they say then that Jesus predicted the coming of Muhammad? Well, once again, the Quran forces them. It compels them. So in Surah 61, verse 6, And remember Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am the messenger of Allah sent to you, confirming the law which came before me and giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad. But when he came to them with clear signs, they said, this is evident sorcery. So what do you have here? What do you have here? Jesus is predicting the coming of a messenger. There's a messenger coming after Jesus. And so because Jesus said that there was a messenger that would come after him, and that can only be Muhammad, because according to Islam, between Jesus and Muhammad, there were no other prophets. And in the Hadith, Muhammad says that between me and the son of Mary, there is no other prophets, that I am the closest to the son of Mary. That is to say, there are no prophets between 33 AD and 570 AD when Muhammad's born. So because the Quran says that Jesus predicted the coming of Muhammad, what did Muslims do? They looked all over the New Testament Gospels to see whether or not Muhammad could be found there. And so they went to John 14, 15, 16. But here's the problem. How many times have you heard Muslims say, the gospel you have is not the gospel that Jesus had? The gospel you have, you have four books, you have four gospels. But Jesus only had one gospel. And so they assume the word gospel means a book. It doesn't. It means good news. <clears throat> it means glad tidings. But, but Muslims will say, well, you have four books, but those aren't the gospel of Jesus. Well, if those four books are not the gospel of Jesus, why are you going to the gospel of John to show that Jesus predicted the coming of Muhammad? So which one is it? Is it reliable or isn't it? Is it the gospel or isn't it? So this is why when I deal with Muslims, folks, it's, it becomes so easy to pull the rug under their feet because they don't see their inconsistencies. They don't see their contradictions. And that's why it becomes laughable because Muslims are saying one thing and then they say another and they are simply all over the board. They're like a ping pong floating and, and, and jumping all over Niagara Falls. So here's the problem, folks. The major problem with this approach is that all of the Greek manuscripts we have of John's Gospels contain the word parakletos, which, as we saw, means counselor, comforter, and never parakletos. We have over 5,700. It's it's now more than that, folks. We've, we've, there's been a lot more manuscripts that have been discovered of the New Testament, and not one of them contains the word parakletos, as Muslims claim. Parakletos is a noun, whereas parakletos is an adjective. These are two completely different words. But only Parakletos appears in the manuscripts. The irony in the Muslim use of John 14 to 16 is that these chapters are heavily Trinitarian in nature. They speak of the economical Trinity, how the persons of the Godhead function. For example, the, the Father sends the Holy Spirit in the name of the Son. The Son also sends the Holy Spirit from the Father. So once again, you can't have your cake and eat it too. If Jesus sends the Comforter, who is the Spirit of Truth, and this is Muhammad, then this means that Muhammad is the messenger of Jesus, which means that Jesus is God. Why? Because if you say Muhammad is Rasul Allah, Rasul means the messenger of Allah. Rasul Allah means the messenger of Allah. If Jesus sends the comforter and the comforter is Muhammad, according to the Muslims, then that means that Jesus is God because Muhammad is the messenger of God. He is the one sent by God. Do you see how we get into problems here, folks? If Jesus sends Muhammad and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, then Jesus must necessarily be Allah since Muhammad is his messenger. He is sent by Jesus <laughs> using their logic here. But the Quran says that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And they will say, oh, no, 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 that can't be Jesus. Well, then who sent Muhammad? Was it Allah or Jesus? And so here's the problem, folks, is that there's this grave inconsistency. Now, Jesus says that the Father will give you another comforter. Well, Jesus said to the disciples, look, the Father's going to give you another comforter. During his earthly life, Jesus had been their comforter. Now that he was going to leave them, he promised them another comforter in his absence, the Holy Spirit. The other comforter was, as he said, the spirit of truth. If Jesus meant Muhammad by the word comforter, 
Would it not be absurd for Jesus to have said he will give you another Muhammad? I mean, that makes no sense. The disciples did not have to wait 600 years for the Comforter to come. He came over a month after the death and resurrection of Jesus on the day of Pentecost, as we see in the book of Acts 2, 1 to 4. Jesus kept his promise. The Comforter did come on the day of Pentecost. He said that the Comforter will be with you forever. Jesus said this Comforter will be with the disciples forever, but Muhammad did not stay with his followers forever. He died in AD 632. And the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, has been with the church for over 2,000 years, and he is still with us. That Comforter has never left the church. The Holy Spirit is still with us. He's regenerating sinners. He gives life to sinners. He brings them into the kingdom. And without the Holy Spirit, there can be no salvation, no regeneration. He guides us in our Bible studies. He opens the scriptures to our minds, just like Jesus said he would do. He will convict the world of sin. He will judge the world because of their wickedness and unrighteousness. Jesus said, you know him. He said to the disciples, you know the comforter. The disciples knew the Holy Spirit, but Muhammad was not even born until more than 500 years later. And obviously he was not known by the disciples of Jesus. In other words, Jesus says you would know who he is. But for that to be true, the disciples would still have to be alive, which means that the Holy Spirit is the only candidate. Jesus says he dwells with you. The Holy Spirit dwelled with the disciples of Jesus, and thus this was something the disciples experienced in their lifetime. Muhammad was not even born until over 500 years later. So again, this person, this comforter, is one who dwells with us. He dwells with the church. He dwells with believers. Jesus said he will be in you. So the Holy Spirit would be in the disciples, and by extension, all believers in Jesus. And this shows us that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a spiritual reality. It's not a physical one. This can never be said of Muhammad. I mean, if someone says, did you know, you know Muhammad is in you? Well, you know, let's not even go there. What do you mean Muhammad's in us? No, this is a spiritual presence, a spiritual reality. The Holy Spirit would be in believers. He is in us. If you belong to Christ, then you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. You see, folks, at the end of the day, Jesus is the ultimate theme of the Scriptures. He told us in John 5, 39 to 40, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, the Scriptures, that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So what did Jesus say about the scriptures? Well, he said, well, you think you have eternal life in them. You think that in them you have eternal life. You're not going to get eternal life by reading the scriptures. You will get eternal life by going to the one that the scriptures are pointing to. So the scriptures, folks, is like those signs on the highway. They are pointers. They are directions. They are pointing away from themselves to their object. And the object of the scriptures is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus says, it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So Jesus is the theme of the scriptures. They point to him. And therefore, all of scripture, right? Luke 24, 44. Uh, I don't have this on the PowerPoint. But in Luke 24, 44, Jesus says, everything written about me in the law and, and in, in, in the prophets and in the Psalms, all of it must be fulfilled. This has nothing to do with Muhammad, nothing at all. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Muhammad is, however, mentioned. Now, Karm asked me at the beginning, is Muhammad mentioned in the Bible? And I gave a two-pronged uh, two response to that, uh, no and yes. I mentioned the no part. And here is the yes part. Is Muhammad mentioned in the Bible? Yes. Matthew 24, 11, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Muhammad is one of those false prophets that the Lord Jesus Christ warned us about. Number two, 1 John 2, 22 to 23. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son as the Father also. So, who is the liar, according to the Bible? The liar is the one who does two things. Number one, he denies that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, Muslims will say, oh no, we believe Jesus is the Messiah, 
But hang on, it doesn't stop there. The Antichrist will further deny the Father and the Son. Do Muslims deny the Father and the Son? You betcha they do. They deny that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. They deny that God is the Father, not only of the Lord Jesus Christ, but of all believers. So Antichrist will deny that Jesus is the Messiah, right? Because the Antichrist is the, 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 the counterfeit who claims to be the true Christ. He opposes the real Christ, but he does something else. He denies the deity of the Son. He denies the deity of the Father. He denies the triune nature of God. He denies the Father and the Son. And Muhammad fits the bill. The Bible warns us, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Because Muslims deny that Jesus is truly the Son of God, they don't have the Father. They don't have the true God. John 20, verse 31, he tells us, these are written that you may believe two things. Notice, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So those are the two things that are necessary for salvation, believing Jesus is the Messiah, believing he's the Son of God. What did Peter say, Matthew 16, 16, when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Remember what Peter said? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the confession of the church. That is the rock upon which the church is built. It's not Peter. It's the confession of Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of God. And so because Muslims will say, we believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Bible goes on to say, not enough. He, you have to believe that he's also the Son of God. If he's not the Son of God, then you are lost. If you deny he's the Son of God, you're lost. So Muslims want to play have you know havesies. Let's go halves here. Let's go Dutch here. You know, we'll, we'll just believe he's the Messiah, but we will reject that he's the Son of God. You can't do that. See, our Christ is not reducible. Your Christ is reducible because he's just a man. He's just a talking head who talks about Muhammad. But the God of the Bible, the Christ of the Bible, as we talked earlier, I was talking to Karm about um, with Al Fadi's uh, um, conference. I'm going to be talking about the hypostatic union. I'm going to be talking about how how Christ is one person with two natures. He's truly God, but truly man, which which uh, Muslims also deny. So, it's clear from a consistent and honest reading of all the texts mentioned above that the Muslim claim that Muhammad is prophesied in the Bible is absolutely baseless. One can make the Bible or any book say anything one wishes if context is ignored. The same is true of the Quran. If we are going to appreciate proper exegesis, that is reading out of the Bible, we have to be consistent with its context, its grammar, its historical setting. When the Bible is read this way, it will become quickly evident that the Bible does not predict the coming of Muhammad at all, except false prophets. It rather points to him who is the theme and subject of its focus, the one whom the disciples testified, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. And so with that, uh, Karim, I am done. I think you're muted, Karim. I think you're muted. Yes, I was muted. Thank you. Um, that was so good. That was so good. You know what I feel like though, if a Muslim was watching, <laughs> I feel like they would say, they would skip all the way to the part where you said, yes, Muhammad is mentioned in the Bible. And then that's all they would hear. They wouldn't hear any, they would just focus on that. You said he was, and yeah, it'll, that probably, it'll probably show up on TikTok. Uh, yeah, and that you were admitting to it. Oh, Dr. Costa admits Muhammad's in the Quran. Yeah. 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 yeah and that's a little frustrating because like, we we you just went through all of this and they still won't accept it and that's frustrating because we want them to accept it so then they can see what a lie islam is and they could leave that but instead they just continue to make more excuses and you know like it says in the bible god what is it blinds their eyes and ears you know so we just have to pray for them. Um, but it's frustrating because we want so badly for them to see that. Yeah, um, and, that, and the key word there, uh, uh, Karim, is is see, right? I mean, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of the sage has blinded the minds of those who do not believe so that they will not see 
the glory of God in Christ Jesus. And so uh, where does the devil, uh, notice it says he blinds the minds, not the eyes, Yeah. right? Because, I mean, obviously, if you're not blind, you could see, but he blinds the minds, the, 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 the faculty of reason and processing thoughts and logic and so forth. So when Satan blinds the minds, he does that so that they don't think straight. They can't process this information. And therefore, we need to pray that, that, that God removes that blindness and that God grants them repentance. Yeah, and with that information, I feel like it's a lot easier for us to understand that it's really not their fault. Like they can't, they just, there's nothing that we could say to them to, because personally, it's frustrating for me when you're talking to someone and it's like, how can you not see this? Because um, they can't. <laughs> That's right, the right. So it kind of like. Yeah, I mean, and, and we also need to be careful that, I mean, I mean, they cannot see, but they're still morally culpable. They're still morally accountable to right. God. I mean, Judas Iscariot, even though, you know, Jesus knew he would betray him, he was still culpable. He was still morally accountable for uh, betraying the Son of God and, and and betraying him, you know, betraying innocent blood. So in one sense, you're right. They cannot see, but then morally, they are still accountable to God because um, of their conscience. So what do you do personally when you um, find yourself in front of someone who just rejects that? Like, how does the conversation go for you? Well, um, what I do is I, I, I engage with them. I try them, try to try to make them see the logic behind it, the arguments. If they don't accept it, I just say, listen, you know, I'll pray for you. Uh, in fact, if you want, can we pray right now? If they're willing to pray, I'll pray with them right away. Uh, if not, I would just say, look, uh, I'll keep praying for you. Uh, and I would encourage you to read these passages in context and treat the Bible the way you'd want me to treat the Quran. You don't want me to treat the Quran and wrench passages out of context. And so we need to respect each other in that in that way. When I read the Quran, I try my very best to read it in context. Yeah. I've even had to correct Christians who Christians uh, will go off the deep end and say, well, the Quran says this, this, this. And it's like, well, actually, no, it doesn't say that. And so they think that I'm I'm defending the Muslim cause when all I'm saying is, Let's show some integrity. Let's let the Quran speak. Let's let the Bible speak. And let's be at least honest with the context of those books. Yeah, I agree. Because even like maybe some people think that it's helping them benefit um, by saying it the way that they do. But even when we do say it in the correct context, it's still it's still wrong. Like there's it's not going to make us say, oh, it's um, maybe they have a point here. But no, there's. There's yeah, like just last June, I was in uh, in Minnesota, and mm -hmm. uh, we were at a huge mosque there, a, a uh, Somali mosque. And uh, I was talking to one of the, the sheikhs. It's actually on my YouTube channel. It, uh, it's a live uh, interview. And I was just telling the sheikh, I said, you know, in the Quran, uh, you, you say that God can never enter his creation. He says, oh, no, no, we don't believe that. God can never enter his creation. So I just said, well, when God appeared to Moses, it says, uh, that the the bush the bush was on fire and it says blessed is he who's in the fire uh, well who's in the fire and he struggled i said well is that fire created fire or is it uncreated and he's like well it 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 it, it must be an angel but it doesn't say blessed are the angels it says blessed is he who is in the fire well who was speaking to moses out of the fire it was allah so so he was really trying to ignore that passage run from that passage because I was using his own book to show him in his own Quran that Allah was in his own creation. He was in the fire, in the burning bush, speaking to Moses. And therefore, that is something that shows that he can actually enter his creation. And therefore, the incarnation should not be a problem. And that, that's what I've noticed, too, is that when you show them things such as that, they're okay with just skipping over it and never going back to it to try to find an um, an answer or an, a reason for that. They're okay with that. Um, that's right. And that's the things that they need to go back to, the things that they skip over, they need to go back to and, and get those answers. I know going to school with Muslims that, you know, the fear of them questioning Allah is so embedded in them that they just don't even like the second they start questioning or they, they find themselves at that point where they're questioning things, they stop and just move forward and they're okay with that. And that's a really scary thought um, to be, or a scary position to be in when you're so afraid to question something. Yeah. But like, like the Quran says, you know, the Allah and it, what is it? Slave 
slave to a uh, master uh, yep. relationship. So yep. that's acceptable for them. So that's why it's okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I've said before that, you know, the unexamined faith is not worth believing. Yeah. So Christianity has stood the test of time. I mean, critics attack the Bible and Jesus, uh, the historicity of Jesus and so forth. And here we are, Christianity is still here and the gospel is still being preached. We're not afraid yeah. of questions. Our, you know, our God does, does not have a, a glass chin like Allah. Allah has a glass chin. Uh, he can't take the questions. Uh, and so if, you're, if your faith cannot be critically examined, then I don't trust it because there's obviously they're hiding something. Yeah, you know, I remember having a conversation with my Muslim friend in high school and him saying to me, who are you to question Allah? Who are you? Like he is the God of, you know, of all. Like, who are you? And I remember, you know, being 16 and thinking, yeah, like, who am I? Like, I remember, you know, just kind of like sitting back and just thinking, I'm, I shouldn't like it because it almost made it like a parent yeah. child, you know, relationship. Like yeah. I know growing up, my parents were strict and who am I to question what they say? You know, it's yeah. like that authority. So yeah. it made sense to me. But right. now as I'm an adult, you know, our salvation is at, yeah. at hand. Like we, yeah. we have to question because yeah. when we die, there's no way to no. go back and say, let's no. do this again. I no. didn't mean that, you know? Yeah. It, God is not afraid of our questions. I mean, right. read the book of Job. There's tons of questions there. Yeah. And Job asks God and he's, he is like, you know, why, why was I born? Why are you allowing this to happen? Right. And all God does is when God appears at the end, Job 40, 41, when God appears to Job, uh, he basically says, you know, well, Answer me this, Job. He doesn't punish Job. In fact, he punishes his friends. He, yeah. he tells Job, make sacrifice for your friends because because they should have treated you with compassion and love. And here they are criticizing you while you're suffering. So God had no no issues with Job asking questions when Jeremiah cried out to God with questions and and, and you know don't you care about your people, etc. Um, God does not punish us for asking questions. He says, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are red as crimson, they shall be white as wool. God invites us to come and to reason with him. He's not afraid of our questions. And so why would Allah be why why would Allah be afraid of questions? If he is true and he has the truth, then certainly Allah can take the questions of a puny little human being. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, Jesus engaged people, he made them think, he, you know, he he asked questions. Uh, but in case of Muhammad, we're told in the Hadith, Muhammad said, God has God has has cursed you for asking too many questions. I, I kind of look at it like this, like not me personally, but if you've got something to hide, you don't want people to ask you questions, right? You yeah. you you kind of uh just go around things and and if you're lying about something, you know, you make a big deal about it and you know, don't ask me questions. But if you've got nothing to hide. Yep. Ask me, ask exactly. me whatever you want. I'll yeah, you show see, you. You see, it wasn't the founding fathers of the United States that created the Fifth Amendment. It, it was actually Muhammad. You know, <laughs> I plead the Fifth. Uh, you know, I'm not getting. No, I'm not answering any questions. No, no. Allah pleads the Fifth. He will not answer your questions. There you go. <laughs> so, oh so, yeah, the Fifth Amendment. Uh, I think. Uh, I think Muhammad came up with that. Yeah, that's that's good. Okay, we have some questions. So. Okay. Um, Deneen, who I met in California, she was there at the Strong Tower Conference. No. Uh, she asked, where do Muslims get the idea that Abraham took Ishmael and not Isaac to sacrifice on Mount Moriah? That is okay. a good question. Very good question. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 commentators, the commentators are divided on this question. So uh, if you look at what Muslim scholars have said, uh, about half of them say it was, it was Ishmael. Another half will say that it was Isaac. They, they based this on the view that, that Ishmael was older than Isaac and that um, <clears throat> that Ishmael, even though the Quran never says it was Ishmael or Isaac, it doesn't name the son of Abraham there, um, they simply will take one or the other. They assume since Ishmael was older than Isaac that this would have been the, the candidate. They think Isaac was way too young at the time when Abraham took him to sacrifice him. So... That's the reason why. And the other reason is because they know Isaac is the ancestor of the Jews and there's this anti-Semitic uh, undercurrent in, in Islam. So they will say, no, Ishmael is the favorite and, 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 and Ishmael is the, is the father of the Arabs. Uh, but then there are others who say, well, no, actually it wasn't Ishmael, it was actually Isaac. So 
the Muslim commentators cannot even agree on who the son of Abraham was. We know because the Quran, the Bible tells us it was Isaac in Genesis 22. But what the Quran does say is that um, that God saved the son of Abraham with a tremendous sacrifice. So when the ram was caught in the thicket, Abraham sacrificed the ram in the place of Isaac. So I asked my Muslim friends, why did Allah need a ram to be sacrificed if he doesn't need sacrifices? Why can he just forgive and let it go? Why did he need an animal to die in the place of Isaac? Because it says we redeemed the son of Abraham with a mighty, a stupendous sacrifice. So here's a place in the Quran, the only place in the Quran, where you have this idea of a sacrifice being made so that another might live. So in answer to Deneen's question, um, the, 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 the commentators are divided on this. Those who say it was Ishmael base it on that he was older and that he was allegedly the father of the Arabs. But there's a good amount of, of Muslim commentators on the other end who would say, no, it was actually Isaac. Another thing that I've noticed about Muslims is that they're not, um, they don't care to really investigate to see if these stories are true or the background of them or how they, they just, they just have no interest at all. They don't have any desire to, to read the, the Quran to, or, or fact check it. They just, they just believe it. And yep. that's just how it is. And that's sad. That's right. That's right. Because the Quran really doesn't care too much about history, Karn, right? Yeah. I mean, you've got you've got um, you've got Haman opposing Moses uh, yeah. at the same time the Tower of Babel is being built. You've got uh, Mary is the sister of Moses, but she's the mother of Jesus. The Quran has a terrible view of history. So so what's Haman uh, doing opposing Moses in the court of Pharaoh when Haman isn't born until centuries later in the Persian Empire in the time of Esther? What there were no Persians at the time of Moses. They come much, much later, but yet the Quran has Haman, who is a Persian, an Agagite actually, who, who, who tries to kill all the Jews in Persia. They, it places him in Egypt uh, around 1400 BC in the court of Pharaoh opposing Moses, at which time the, the Tower of Babel is being built when it wasn't built until centuries before Pharaoh and, and even before Abraham. So, And then when it says Mary, the sister of, of, of Aaron, is the mother of Jesus, there is no concept of time. The Quran is like, it's it's like this smorgasbord of events that are taking place with no regard to history. Uh, and so in that respect, the Quran fails in yeah. terms of history. So what happens when you bring this, like these facts up to Muslims? What do you find that they normally, that, that they do? Well, what they would say is, well, that was a different Haman. That wasn't the same Haman in the book of Esther, but Haman, uh, Haman is, is, is clearly a Persian name. And um, there are no records of a Haman in Egypt because the Persians weren't around yet at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the Quran says this, that a Samaritan uh, influenced the Israelites in the wilderness to, to build a golden calf. But there were no Samaritans until 722 BC. Like the Samaritans came when, when the Assyrian kingdom invaded northern Israel in 922, uh, in 722 BC. It was the, the Assyrians, when they intermarried with the Israelites, that the Samaritans were the, the byproducts of this union between Israel, Assyrians and Israelites. But that didn't happen until 722 BC. That is, that is like 700 years after Moses. So what is a Samaritan doing? in the desert with the Israelites. I mean, that's like me saying, Karim, I, I opened a book from the time of, you know, let's say 200 BC and, and it said, or 200 AD, uh, excuse me, from the first century. I opened this manuscript and it says, Jesus got, came out of a Rolls Royce and said, <laughs> I, like, I like KFC best. I mean, we call those anachronisms because there, these things did not exist at the time. And yet the Quran is filled with them. There were no Samaritans in the time of Moses. There were no Persians, and even Pharaoh is crucifying people. There was the, the Egyptians did not crucify people. Crucifixion came through the Persians around 500 or so BC. There was no crucifixion in the time of Egypt. So there is no regard for time. And then Alexander the Great, of course, uh, as Zulkarnain, uh, he's a Muslim and, and he's a servant of Allah. And all we know about Alexander the Great was that he was a polytheist, he was a sodomite, and he believed himself to be the son of Apollo, the sun god. So there's so many historical blunders. There's so many historical anachronisms. 
Uh, we know the sources of the Quran are all pre-Islamic. They come from Jewish Christian sources, Zoroastrian sources, um, and Arabic folklore, Christian folklore. So uh, there's nothing, there is nothing uh, unique about the Quran. There's nothing special about it. So let me get this straight. So Jesus didn't have a Rolls Royce? That's No. He didn't, I mean, he didn't have that. Okay. Probably, there, there was probably KFC, kosher, oh, okay. kosher fried chicken. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was kosher fried chicken in Nazareth. Sure. We don't know. But no, no. Uh, this is why I bring this up is because I'm, I'm trying to point Good example. out. Good example. It is. We, got major, and we don't find yeah. that in the Bible, though. In right. the Bible, you don't find these anachronisms. You, you find the Bible speaking of, you know, in this year, you know, King Uzziah died and Isaiah had a vision of the Lord in the temple. It even tells you when he had that vision. We, we know the year Uzziah died. Uh, we know that in this year, in this month, the Babylonians came against Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. The Bible is interested in history because history is God's cross theater. God performs his purposes on, uh, on the plank of, of world history. The Quran doesn't care about that. It's not interested in history. All it's interested is in guidance. Islam is guidance yeah. and Muhammad is the last messenger. And that's what's so sad. It's so sad. I, I just can't imagine being brainwashed my entire life um, to believe certain things. You know, the Bible is corrupted. Don't believe it. You know, Jesus is not the son of God. All these things. And that Allah, you know, the the word, the Quran is, is you know, perfectly preserved. You know, to be brainwashed. I mean, I, I, I kind of understand a little bit to, to the point where I, I see that they... They believe this um, and it's so strong because it's embedded in them since they were tiny. You know, that's like, you know, um, maybe someone telling, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, you know, someone telling me I'm Puerto Rican my whole entire life. And then all of a sudden at age 30, you know, someone set telling me, no, you're not. It's well, yeah, it's true. It's true. Well, Dios te bendiga, hermana. <laughs> Gloria al nombre de Jesus. No, that's good. That's good. When are you going to start your Spanish channel? <laughs> you see, I, I speak in tongues and I also <laughs> interpret. I translate. Oh, that's good. Okay. We have another question. Let me see. Uh, right. So we have from Joel. Joel, um, my fellow Puerto Rican friend. How do we know who the Arabs descended from? Yeah, it, the, the Table of Nations is mentioned in Genesis 10. And I believe you have an ancestor there by the name of Juval, I believe, J-U-V-A-L. And many believe him to be the, the ancestor of the Arabs. So the ancestor of the Arabs is found in Genesis 10 in the Table of Nations, right? We know that Abraham came from the line of Shem. So the word Semite or Semitic comes from the name Shem, uh, the son of Noah. Uh, so Abram comes through his line. The Semites come through his line. And I believe it's either Juval or Jubal, I believe. Uh, I'd have to check it out. But you can find that in Genesis 10, where you have the 70 nations, the table of all the nations of the world. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, here's another question from Deneen. Um, Isn't Eid al-Adha? Uh, al uh, yeah. yeah, a celebration of Ishmael and his sacrifice. I worked with a Muslim lady who took the day off of work for this. Yes, yes. Eid al-Adha is a celebration of the sacrifice. Again, some believe it was Ishmael, some believe it was Isaac. Um, so this is the time when Muslims go and it's a very bloody festival because yeah. they slit the throats of camels and goats and sheep and cattle uh, all over the place. And they do it publicly. Um, um, but the question is this, why do you have to... Uh, why do you have to kill these animals? Why do you need to shed blood? And many of them will say, oh, it's because we're imitating Abraham. We're doing what Ibrahim, what, what the prophet Ibrahim did. Okay, but but why? Right. I mean, why? why? Why did he have to kill that animal? So what you're actually admitting in the Eid al-Adha is that a sacrifice had to be made to save the son of Abraham. But why would God need blood sacrifice? Because Muslims keep telling us God doesn't need blood sacrifice. He didn't right. need Jesus to die. So during this time, in fact, they were celebrating that when we were in Minnesota, in Minneapolis. This is some of the questions we're asking our Muslim friends. What is the what is the significance of this feast of sacrifice? What did that sacrifice do? Is it, it's not just a time to let's just have beef um, or, or or goat or whatever. Um, what is the significance <clears throat> of that sacrifice? And so that leads us to Christ. 
the, the meaning of the, the atonement and so forth. So most Muslims will celebrate this by simply killing animals and feasting and giving some of that to the poor and so forth, but they never dwell on why that sacrifice had to be made. Right. It's so sad because they celebrate it, but it's like they don't know why right. they celebrate it. It's not important. They just are no. told to do it and yeah. that's it. It's like our Jewish friends. Whenever they have the Passover, they celebrate the Passover. They don't understand that there's on the table, there's three matzahs, three matzahs, right? The matzah bread. And the second one, the second one is called the afikomen. And, and the word afikomen is, is not Hebrew, it's actually Greek. And it means he who comes. And they take that middle one, they break it, and then they wrap it up in a, in a shroud. They shroud it. And then they hide it in the house. And then at the end of the, of the Seder, they, the children go looking for this, and then they find it, they bring it out, they unveil it, and then they all eat of it. So who is the second one among the three who is the one who is to come, the Afikomen? How is it that they break it, they put it in a shroud, they wrap it up in a white cloth, and then they hide it, they bury it. And then it's brought out, and then it's opened, and everyone eats. Yeah. It's so obvious what this is pointing to. The rabbis can't don't understand what, what this is all about. But it certainly sounds like one who died, he was buried, shrouded, was brought forth, and then gave life to the world. Yeah, and that's what the enemy is so good at, right? Counterfeiting, right. changing things around and making things yeah. what they're not. Um, and that's why it's so awesome that people like you really un take took the time to study and learn about these things. Um to share it with all of us. I know the chat, all uh, everyone in the chat has been so blessed by this teaching tonight. I personally as well. Uh, we have one more question. So Deneen is asking, have you ever heard of the ex-Muslim, now Christian, named Hossein, who lives in Canada? He has a YouTube channel called Whoever Has the Sun. Um, I have heard of him. I've heard of him. In fact, um, I have a young man by that name in my in the church that I'm pastoring. Um, uh, I heard of him, but I haven't had any correspondence with him. Canada is, by the way, the second largest country in the world. <laughs> it's a huge country. So I'm not sure where in Canada that he lives, but I, I praise the Lord for him. I, I feel like I've heard of this channel. I have to go check. I'm going to go check him out. I love hearing, um, ex-Muslim stories um, and how they're Christian now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so awesome to now, like, I know, like, they're so bold now to leave Islam. And, and I mean, it's still a scary time. It's not easy, but you're hearing, we're hearing more and more of Absolutely. these stories and the Absolutely. testimonies. You know, if you were at the Strong Tower Conference, we had yeah. um, ex-Muslims in there mm -hmm. talking about, you know, one thing that really, um, um, caught me by surprise is there was a, a Somali, an ex-Muslim there. She's Somali. And she said that um, she came to America when she was nine. Um, and no one for the longest time, no one had ever spoke to her about Jesus. Like she right. didn't know anything about him. And it's, it really struck me. It, it kind of like made me realize that, you know, all these um, concentrated Muslim communities that Christians, you know, a lot of Christians don't want to step foot into, or they just don't know how to do any of the evangelizing, but it's so important to, because they're so secluded and they're all in, in, you know, they're like almost like protected in this little space and yeah. no outsiders come in and, and they don't ever, they can possibly go their whole life without really knowing who Jesus is. And, but because someone um, spoke to Jesus, um, you know, introduced her, that was the seed that was needed. And I hope that, you know, hearing that it encourages us, encourages us as Christians to not be afraid to speak the gospel, to don't be afraid to approach Muslims because they do love Jesus. They want to talk about him. Right. And, um, you know, you never know. Um, they may be questioning their faith. Um, you, you just don't know who you, when you encounter someone like them. That's right. And, and here, here in Canada, um, I have not only seen, I have seen Muslims come to faith, some of them through my ministry, through my YouTube channel. And I've had <clears throat> the great privilege of baptizing a lot of Muslims here. Wow. Um, uh, baptizing, uh, well, I remember one family from uh, Iran that came to Christ. Wow. Um, another one who, who saw me on YouTube and 
and and came to my church and and he wanted baptism and and so um and from every part of the world and, and so god is is calling muslims to himself there's no doubt about it these are great days that we're living in um and there are more and more of them the the the, the mass of of muslims leaving islam is greater now than ever before I can't even begin to explain how that makes me feel. You know, growing up in Dearborn, um, uh, now it's more mo most Muslim. It's a strong community. Um, I still have family there. I love my city. I do it, but it it hurts me to see um, how blinded they are. And when I hear of any Muslim, you know, leaving Islam, it it does something to me. I just, I praise God for that, especially, you know, I know that not all Muslims will leave Islam and, you know, convert right away, but I believe that they are truly on a mission to seek the truth that it will lead them to Christ. And yes. I've met a lot of people and because of people like you, you know, not afraid to speak uh, the, the gospel and, or speak to Muslims and not, not afraid of any of that, you know, um, and in your channel and all the things that you do, I, I believe that um, it, it, with the access of the internet, it helps them so much because a lot of them, they live in fear. They don't, they don't want to ask their neighbor or, or just be seen with a Christian and, and looking like they're in deep conversation. And so having this on the internet, they can go be alone and, and, and learn and, it's so amazing to me uh, that it's happening and it's happening more and more. And, but because of ministries like yours. Um, so I appreciate everything that you do. Um, this is very special to me. So it's something that's on my heart and I'm constantly praying for Muslims to come to Christ. Um, Amen. And you know, the, the internet karm is the death blow to Islam because yeah. Muslims now can actually check the sources out for themselves. I mean, way back in, in the early 1990s, when I started debating with Shabir Ali in Toronto, yeah. uh, in Canada, um, you know, in those days you'd have to to get photocopies from the local library and 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 you know, quote books, bring books to the table, and um, the very things that I was challenging back then that the Quran has been changed, that there's variants in the Quran, um, uh, that that the Quran is not this perfectly preserved book. Um, at that time, uh, people were saying, oh, no, you're just making that up. You just got a bias against uh, against the Quran. Well, now with the, the Internet, information now, is, is, you can access information in seconds now as right. opposed to hours in the library. Muslims are now beginning to admit, they're beginning to look at this and say, yeah, you guys were right after all. Uh, and they can check this online. They could read the Hadith online. They could check out sc scholarly sources online. So... Um, so the, the internet in many respects, and even Muslim imams are admitting this, yeah. the internet in many respects is being used by God in a way to bring the gospel to them that, that in the past would be very difficult to get through, including other places around the world. Yeah. It's a good thing. I mean, it can be bad, but for and overall with, with this, in, uh, with this information at our fingertips, it's, it's a good thing. And uh, along with other religions as well. <clears throat> Truth. So, Truth, the truth will set you free. Amen. Really and, <laughs> and we need to understand that um, facts don't, as ben, as ben Shapiro wisely said, facts don't care about your feelings. It's true. And and truth is truth. And um, and so to my Muslim friends, I keep always asking them, if what you have is true, then you should not be afraid of questioning it. Yeah. If it's true, it's going to pass the test. There's nothing to be afraid. Um the fact that you can't even criticize your own book, you can't right. even criticize your own prophet because Allah says, Surah 33, that when Allah and his messenger have decided on a given uh, on a given point, it is not for the for the, uh, the slave man or, or, or woman to question what Allah and his messenger have, have uh, approved of. So um, there is no critical thinking in Islam. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, Muslims have to basically live on this fear. Uh, and I think a lot of Muslims, a lot of, especially women in particular, are the most vulnerable in this area. I think there's a lot of Muslim women who know Islam is false, but they're afraid because you've got issues like honor killings and, of course, the apostasy laws and so forth.
Yep. And like, uh, I'll go back to Dearborn. Um, it's such a small community that if anyone hears that you're even questioning or you took your hijab off or anything like that, like you're ostracized, like people talk. It's it's such like I, I didn't realize that how, how small of a city I was from until I left it. And then I realized that everything that I had learned, everything that I had understood wasn't what it was. But I, I understand that being from such a small city, how they can stay in that small mind um, way of thinking because they don't leave the city and everyone, your neighbor, all of them think the same way. So it's like one supporting the, the other. So it's not until someone comes along and starts, you know, rattling things up. I remember being told um, that the, the Quran is so it's such a miracle that um, if if you ripped it up in the sea, if you ripped it up and threw it in the sea, that it would formulate and come back together in one piece. Um, I remember thinking like, wow, because, you know, growing up as a Christian, as a kid, I, I knew that God could do miracles. And I was confused at that time being that, you know, God and Allah, you know, because they kept telling me they're the same, they're the same person or the same, you know, God that um, I remember thinking, okay, well, it's just another miracle that he can do, you know, but now, it, it just doesn't make sense. And and so I think that it's, it's good that we, you know, question these things and not just believe, you know, something that their sitto said and, you know, going down the line of, of just, um, tales. That's how I feel like it is. Yeah. Well, just don't tell David what about ripping up the Quran and throwing it in the ocean and it'll come because he'll probably do an experiment on his YouTube channel. Yeah. That would be a good one. I, sh I actually, I'm going to tell him about it. Okay. Well, you know, he'll start that experiment. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, let me see. Do we have any more questions? Um, it doesn't look like it. Um, yeah, this is a good comment. Islam shall be destroyed at second coming of Christ. Absolutely. Yeah. Amen. That's my brother, Ben Yen. I believe he's, a, he's my a Polish brother. I just want to thank him for, uh, he has posted many of my videos uh, in Polish. Uh, oh. so I've taken a lot of my uh, uh, my videos on my YouTube channel dealing with Roman Catholicism and Islam, and, and he has uh, converted them into, into Polish. So I uh, just want to acknowledge that, brother. That's awesome. See, the internet is such a beautiful thing in all languages to reach the world. Um, that is awesome. So yeah, yeah, awesome, so, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's wonderful. Wonderful. I think uh, Deneen has a question there. Okay. Uh, the the second last, I think. The second last. Oh, do they? Okay, so they don't, but um, they don't by law. I remember in high school, when I was in high school, there was these two sisters that um, they were from Yemen. And um, in in my school, they would, so there's like, it's separated like West Dearborn, East Dearborn. So in South, the South end of Dearborn. So the South end of Dearborn was borderline Detroit. And so they were pr predominantly um, Yemen and um, Palestinian, and they would get bused to the west side of Dearborn and they would come to our school. So those those girls, um, I guess their father had heard about them, you know, talking to boys or dating or whatever teenage girls do, and he killed them. And um, I remember that was the first time I had heard anything like that. And I I mean, all through school, I knew I knew that the boys were so strict on their sisters like they were. But I just in my mind, because I was told this is that is because, you know, the brothers, they just care about that. They just care. And I know um, my brothers, I had I have a, a lot of brothers, three brothers, and um, they were strict on me, too, but not in this way. But I, I related it to, oh, they're just they just want to make sure their sisters are not getting in trouble. I didn't realize that it was a whole culture of yeah. this reasoning of and it was so much deeper and so much deeper. In fact, that it would lead to death because you're, you know, disgracing the family You're you know, you're you're going with the American way, as they would say, you know, you you're trying to be American, but he killed them. Yep. He killed them. And um, so the, the, the culture, I guess, accepts it because it's an honor killing, yep. but by law, absolutely not. Um, so yeah. yeah. I mean, we had that in Canada too. Same thing happened. We had a young lady up here who uh, went to school, took her hijab off. Her father and brother kept threatening her and eventually they killed her. They strangled mm -hmm. her. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> her father is still 
I think, I don't know if he passed away in prison, but he was doing life in, in prison. Uh, and so uh, I still remember it very well. Yeah. They, he, he killed her because he refused, she refused to wear the hijab. And then here we, we have a city in Canada, in Ontario called Kingston. Mm. And in Kingston, we had the, the Sharif family where he basically killed, uh, he killed his three daughters because they were dating Western boys. Uh, he killed them. And he also killed a woman that he called was his cousin, but was in fact his second wife. Uh, the marriage wasn't registered with, with, with the Canadian authorities. And uh, he not only killed them, but he submerged their bodies in a car, in a canal. Um, so uh, this happens all the time, all the time. And honor killings, over 90% of them are committed by, uh, by Muslims worldwide. Did that make the news? Yes. There was a yeah. story, right? Because yeah. did he have his son help him as well? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so if you if you search Sharif family. Uh, yeah, Kingston, I remember watching that. Yeah. And and so, yeah, and, and again, uh, Muslims in Tierborn, they will practice Sharia under the nose of the government. And so there are multiple marriages in the United States. They just don't register those marriages with the local with the state, the local state. Right. Same here in Canada. There are Muslims who have multiple wives. Uh, the only thing is they won't register the other marriages with government. Right. Um, and of course, you know, you go into our grocery stores and we have all halal sections and so forth, uh, accommodation. Uh, we had a huge thing here in Canada back in 2000, I can't remember, 2008, uh, where the schools, the public schools were allowing Muslims to use the cafeteria to do their prayers on school time. Um, and they wouldn't allow Christians to have devotions on school time, but they would allow Muslims to do prayers on school time. Uh, and 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 by, by sexually discriminating them as well. So in the cafeterias, they'd have the boys at the front, the girls behind them and the girls that were menstruating, they had to sit at the back of, of the building. That's sexual discrimination under, uh, under Canadian law, but they didn't care because to them it was all accommodation. Right. And it's all part, part of this garbage, this political correctness that is destroying the West. So let me ask you in Toronto, do they serve halal foods in the school system? Yep. Yeah, they do. And uh, KFC has gone halal in Canada as well. So uh, Kentucky fried chicken now is is all halal uh and they they actually put that out here in canada i'm not sure about the united states popeye's chicken is also halal because it's owned by muslims um and um they're also uh they're also pushing uh for that i believe in the united states and in, in the uk as well the united kingdom uh, they're pushing to have that in the prisons as well as many inmates are converting to islam so as a christian how are we to feel about that well, what what I think we should do is the problem is Christians rarely raise their voices. Right. Uh, you know, we're passive. Muslims are active. We're passive. And so what we need to do is, is we need to start, again, confronting this, talking to the, the manager of the grocery store or talk about, you know, why is this being allowed? For example, just quickly, one grocery store here in Toronto, during Christmas, they they would have happy holidays and seasons greetings. But every other religion would get happy Diwali, uh, a happy Eid, and so forth, Ramadan, and uh, Diwali, uh, and even the Moon Festival that Chinese celebrate in September. Well, we confronted the manager and basically said, why is it that during Christmas you have the season's greetings, but everyone else gets, you know, they said, well, it's because, you know, management and because of minority groups, and we don't, know, we don't want to offend the minorities. And I says, but I'm offended. Right. What are you going to do for me? I, you know, I said, you know, we we know a lot of people that shop here, and and we can we can we can uh, boycott and even protest outside your store that you are that you are discriminating against Christians. Well, the following year, guess what they had all over the store? They had Merry Christmas, and that's because we took a stand. Yeah. So I think as Christians, we're so used to being pushed aside, shoved to the side. And we need to take a stand. There was a lady at a church I used to pastor. She said that during Easter, they were talking about um, uh, they were talking about every other religious group. They were talking about Passover and 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 other religious traditions. But during Easter and Good Friday, they didn't say a word. Mm -hmm. And I challenged her to complain. You go and complain and register your complaint and and always use the word "I'm offended" because that's a trigger. Right. Uh, and guess what they did? They actually acknowledged Good Friday, the day Christ died, Easter Sunday, the day of the resurrection. 
And so if we, you know, Edward Burke was right. The only thing necessary for evil to spread is when good men do nothing. And, and so we need to take a stand and, and we can't just let, you know, political correctness, social justice, let all these steamroll us because they will steamroll over us. So specifically, if let's say your child, you were in Dearborn and your child goes to elementary school and they're serving halal food, is it a big deal? Is it not a big deal? What do you do? Well, what I would say is I think parents, uh, you know, parents have been getting a really bad rap in the U.S. They've even been equated with terrorists if they uh, speak against, uh, you know, sexually explicit material being taught to the children in kindergarten in grade one. What I would do is I'd get families together and protest and basically say, um, is this school an Islamic school? No. Is it receiving public funding? Well, if it's receiving public funding, then it should not be a religious school. I mean, isn't that what they said about schools, taking prayer out of the schools? As long as it's publicly funded, there's no place for religion in the schools. Why are you making an exception when it comes to Muslims? So what I would say is, uh, what's the difference between halal chicken and non-halal chicken? What's the difference? Can you tell us what the difference is? Uh, this is not a Muslim school. So why are we accommodating one particular group? Um, and so halal foods are religiously oriented. This is a religious practice. Right. Um, you know, would they accommodate kosher? If there were Jews in that school, would they accommodate kosher? Because Jews will not eat halal food because in order for something to be kosher, it must be drained of blood. Uh, Muslims don't do that. They just, the only thing that makes something halal is that when they when they cut the throat of the animal, they recite the name of Allah. They'll say, Bismillah ar-Rahmin. They'll recite the name of Allah over the animal. That's what makes it kosher. Right. Um, so anyway, what I would say is parents, parents need to take a stand. And remember, you know, this, the, you know, it was groups in the United States, the liberal groups that took prayer out of the schools. And what was their argument? Well, you're getting public funding. If you're getting public funding, then you should not be giving uh, special privileges to religion. If it's privately funded as a Muslim school, fine. That's fine. Or a privately funded as a Christian school. But if it's not, then I think Christians need to stand up and, and, and say, you know what? Uh, this is not right. If it's publicly funded, there should be no special privileges given to any special interest groups. Thank you so much for answering that. That's something that I personally, um, because when I was going to school, none of that was there. Um, now, um, I mean, I've only been out of school a couple of years, <laughs> but um, now uh, it's 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 everywhere. The halal, uh, the halal, um, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, Lunch, lunch menus, the menus yeah. is, is now halal. Yeah. yeah. We have pools here in Canada. We have pools where there are certain hours where only Muslim Muslims could swim because women can't swim with men. Muslim, women can only swim with women. And so in order for that to happen, they, they would have to cover the windows. They would have to have only Muslim women. Um, so they, they all cover this under the whole, you know, human resources with, this is HR accommodation. Yeah. Uh, no, it isn't. It's it's you're giving special privileges right. to uh, to certain groups. And if it's a publicly funded pool, then no, you should not be doing that. If it's privately funded as a Muslim pool, okay, but not if it's publicly funded. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Like personally, like me, I don't know the rights. I don't know how all of that works. So maybe that's why a lot of people don't say anything because they don't know, you know, because we accommodate children at school. You know, if they have to take medicine, we accommodate them. You know, we accommodate, we do a lot of accommodations, but we don't realize that this kind of accommodation is not included unless it's, you know, like you said, it's, it's being funded or uh, specifically um, funded under a certain category. I don't know how to explain that, but yeah, it makes sense that um, we just think that it, it just comes along with accommodation, but these types of things, it, it doesn't um, went religious, right? Because right. they don't accommodate Christians or any other. Yeah. And it is only like that really in Dearborn. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also in Dearborn, you know, that poor baker in Colorado, uh, that poor baker was yeah. taken to court by the LGBTQ community for for not baking a, a cake for their gay wedding. And, and that poor guy was taken all the way to the top. I mean, he eventually won. But you know, Steve Crowder, you know, Steve Crowder, he, uh, who's actually Canadian, but he's, he's now in the US, uh, Steve Crowder actually went to Dearborn 
and went into one of these Muslim bakeries and said, right on camera, he says, you know, me and my boyfriend, well, we're going to have a gay wedding. Can you uh, can you make a, a wedding cake for us? And they said, get out of here. Mm. We, we don't do that here. Well, you don't hear about Muslims being taken to court for not right. doing gay weddings, but you do find Christians. So Christians, if you notice, are always, they're always the target. They're the ones who are being hauled before the courts. They're the ones who are being, uh, we're, we're being told in media that they are fundamentalists, that they are white supremacists, um, that uh, that they're the worst thing that has ever happened. Um, but when it comes to Muslims, oh no, uh, they're, they're, they're an oppressed group, they're a marginalized group. Uh, they've they've suffered colonization, uh, and and so uh, everything about about white America is is that it's it's racist, it's it's a colonizing country, and so forth. Uh, and so Christians have to deal with not just Islam, but they have to deal with this political agenda that that tries to demonize anything that is Christian, uh, the Judeo Christian principles upon which the United States was built, Canada was built, the great nations of the West were built. Um, so. And it's funny when you when here's an example exactly what I'm talking about. So when you when you get groups like um, uh, you get groups like uh, LGBTQ for Palestine, mm -hmm. or or you get queers for Palestine, do they realize that if they were in the West Bank and were basically saying we're queers for Palestine, they'll find the highest building that they can find and they're going to throw you off that building and then they're going to stone you to death. Yeah. And so, sad. so, so, but here's the thing, they don't know, but Muslims will use them. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they will use these groups yeah. to advance their ideas. Even okay. though they know under Sharia law, they'd be killed. Yeah. That makes zero sense to me. It really does. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't get the concept behind it. Um, that's why my book, you know, the book I'm writing and hope to be released soon, No King But Christ, the... The subtitle is the 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 collapse and bankruptcy of secular worldviews, and what I try to do in my book is I try to show that all these secular worldviews that we see today, they're all collapsing and bankrupting, yeah. because there is no truth to them. There's no foundation to them, um, and uh, you know, the Christian gospel is the only thing that can bring equality. It was Christians who abolished the slave trade. William Wilberforce in the United Kingdom abolished the slave trade there and then it, it went into the commonwealth like canada the united states under abraham lincoln with his emancipation act you know a, a releasing the slaves as free men and so forth he, these were christians that abolished the slave trade and what do we keep hearing in america is you guys are racist you guys started the slave trade your ancestors were racists you know slavery still goes on in islam today it still goes on in africa in libya in other countries the sudan Muslims are still practicing slavery today. True. We don't hear anything about that. Right. Eastern slave trade, 40 million, Muslim, uh, 40 million slaves were taken by Muslims into Arabia. You never hear about that. You don't hear about the Muslim colonists who colonized the Middle East, took all of North Africa, Egypt, and went into Israel as far as Spain and Portugal. We don't hear about those colonists. All we hear about is the Western, the English colonists, the, the American colonists, the French colonists. And so we need to wake up to the fact that we are at war yeah. and, and that it is a war against the king, the king Christ Jesus, the king yeah. of kings and the Lord of lords. The nations and the, and, and the peoples are imagining a vain thing. They have come together to, to counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. So we need to understand at the end of the day, it is, a, it is a declaration of war that started in the Garden of Eden when man declared war against their king, God. And today it's a declaration of war against the king of the nations, the king of the universe, the rightful king, yep. who will take his rightful place when he returns. But uh, we just need to be aware of this reality that it's not just Islam that we are engaged against, but also these political forces that are siding with Islam against Christianity. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. So we just need to, you know, really um, be strong in our faith and not be afraid to speak the truth um, and just yeah. lift one another up. I, yeah. I and, and, you know, when we sing those songs, you know, stand up, stand up for Jesus yeah. and, and onward Christian soldiers. Yeah. You know, A.W. A a Tozer once said that Christians are, are known to lie, especially when they sing. 
<laughs> and so when we sing Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, are we really standing up? Right. When we sing Onward, Christian Soldiers, are right. we really, you know, uh, all to Jesus, I surrender. Do we? Right. Do right. we really surrender all to Jesus? Right. You know, if he's not, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. He yep. must be Lord over everything. Amen. Every aspect of our life. Yeah. Uh, and and so th this this is this is the war. Yeah. It's, it's high treason against the King of the Universe, who made us, who created us, who came to us in flesh, um, and the servant King who gave his life for us and rose again victoriously. He's the only hope this world has, and he's the only one that could rid the world of racial distinctions, racial hatred. Uh, you know, the whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. I've been asked many times, what can bring true peace to the region? Very simple. If Jews and Palestinians accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, they'll become brothers and sisters and war will stop. Yes, and I pray for that. I really do. I, I just, the what's happening in the world, um, it's sad. It's so sad and it grieves me. And I just, I pray for the world. I pray for the Middle East. You know, yeah. even as Christians, we don't want what's happening to oh. be happening. We don't want that. Mm. And we don't, we don't find joy um, when, you know, somebody has been murdered, you know, no. it's sad because we know what has happened to them after. Like we, we understand that, you know, when someone who is not a believer in Christ, you know, these leaders, the Muslim terrorists, we know what happens to them when they die. Yeah. So we're not happy about that. Yeah. It's sad. So and it can create so much anxiety. You know, I keep yeah. telling people all the time they get so embroiled in what's going on around the world. And I always ask them this question: who is on the throne? Right. What does Hebrews 12 2 say? Looking unto Jesus, the author and pinch of our faith. If we lose sight of him, we're gonna we're gonna sink into this despair. Yeah. And so, you know, I've read the last chapter of the last book, Carm, and we win. Yeah. We win. Christ we wins. Christ will have the victory. Yeah. Uh, and and so we need to understand that no matter what happens, you know, the Trump election, whether it's Kamala Harris, whether it's going to be right. Donald Trump, at the end of the day, Christ is on the throne and God will accomplish his purposes in, in the world. He will bring about his purposes. Um, and again, it's all about Christ and his kingdom. Um, the world will carry on. When you and I are gone, politics will still continue. Yeah. We've got work to do. We've got to preach the gospel take the gospel out to the nations. That is so true. Um, we Sometimes we get caught up in our day-to-day -day and we forget that God is sovereign and that whatever his will is to be. Um, so we not to, I mean, we need to do our part, but not worry about who's going to be president. I mean, we have, you know, we have our opinions and all of that. That's fine. But in the end, um, God knows what he's doing. He's in control and we should have peace with that. And just like with everything else, you're right. Um, and that does give me peace. You know, when I start to get overwhelmed, I start to remember like, you know, I can't control anything. Um, everything is going to be okay. And like you said, in Revelation, we win. So as long as we we keep our eyes on Jesus and keep our focus and, and just try to speak to as many people as we can about, you know, the gospel um, and do our part, that's all we can do. If everybody does their part, you know, yep. that's all we can do. Yep. And we also need to accept the fact that sometimes when we get people that are not, are not God fearing leaders, that they are bringing the country down. We need to understand that, that God appoints wicked people as well. Yes. As he appointed Nebuchadnezzar right. over Israel and the Assyrian king, he says he is the, he is the Assyrian king will be the staff of my wrath against Israel. You know, John Calvin once said that when God seeks to judge a nation, he appoints wicked rulers over them. So we need to also understand that sometimes the appointment of, of wicked people is also part of God's plan to, to, yeah. to bring judgment. That's true. So that's another reason why we, when bad things are happening, we just need to trust that, again, God is in control and he knows what he's doing. And, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we got to stop hearing this. You know, we hear people say, you know, let, let, let go and let God. <laughs> no, no, no. J.I. Packer said, it's not let go and let God. It's trust God and get going. That's good. I've never heard that. That's good. Yeah, Packer. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Okay, so I don't think we have any more questions tonight. Um, I've been looking, but I just want to thank the chat. Um, you guys have been great hanging in there with us with all your questions and 
uh, all your encouragement. I know everybody was so blessed by tonight. Um, I personally was. It's always so good to hear from you and to hear what you have to say. Um, and I'm so glad it was recorded. We can always go back and, and watch it again. Um, yeah. all, all good stuff. So thank you for coming on tonight. Um, and we will, if, for everyone in the chat, make sure to register for Abd Al Fadi's online conference. Um, we still, you still have time to get your tickets. Uh, you don't want to miss it. Uh, it is, like I said, I've been a part of it the last two years, and it's it's been such a blessing to hear every single person speaking. I mean, it's a little overwhelming. That's why it's good to record so you can go back and watch and 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 not miss one thing. So make sure you get your tickets to to go see that. And make sure you get you you subscribe to Dr. Tony Costa's all his social media so you know when his next book is coming out. What is it? Christ is King? Is that what uh, no other no other king but Christ? Okay. That was close. Yeah. So if people are interested in the in my YouTube channel, I think someone put it on the chat, but it's Toronto Apologetics. So if you just put my name, Tony Costa, Toronto, you will get it. So there's there's some new material being put up there. I, I just finished a review that I'm gonna post soon on. The debate between Dr. William Craig and uh, Mohammed Hijab. Oh yes, uh, on the Trinity. Uh, so uh, that'll be that. That's going to be posted uh, soon. Okay, that's. I'm um, looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, that's always good to see that. Okay, so thank you for coming on tonight. Thank you, chat, and you guys always know if you need if you missed anything, you can always go back and watch it again. And if you would like to support us financially, you can go to ministrytomuslims.com. Um, and always helps when you guys share and like these videos because we want as many people as we can to follow along and hear the word of God. So thank you all for watching tonight. Good night. And I'm always so late at doing this. Hold on. Okay, one second. And good night. <music>